This is my favorite quote. The future is plural. That means there are always multiple futures. There's no one you know, perfect uh, world scenario that happened. There's, there are always a multitude of possible scenarios. That's Alex Sidorenko, and this is episode 116 of the All Things Risk podcast. Welcome and welcome back to the All Things Risk podcast. My name is Ben Catanio. I'm your host. This is my show, which is all about better understanding risk and uncertainty across all aspects of life. We have a great episode for you today, one that takes a very contrarian and interesting view of the discipline and management practice of risk management, something that we don't normally talk about. But before we do that, a quick request. I want to keep growing this show. I want to keep making it better for you. And to do that, I need to know what you like, what you don't like. And so I'd love to hear from you. I would love if you could take two to three minutes of your time to answer a very short survey that you will find in the show notes. So if you can hit pause, offer your thoughts via the link, I would be incredibly grateful. All right, today it's all about risk awareness. And it's a bit of an unusual episode, as I mentioned, because we're going to talk about the risk profession, something that I actually stay away from. And I've stayed away from because I don't think that risk should have its own jargon and rituals and things that only certain hallowed individuals can do. We all take risks and actually the science on risk and decision-making has been around for quite some time. My guest, however, isn't your ordinary risk professional. He is Alex Sidorenko, who has been on the show once before, and Alex is disrupting the whole way in which the industry of risk management works. He runs something called Risk Academy, which offers controversial and counterintuitive thoughts on the practice of risk management. And next week, October the 14th to the 18th, Alex is putting together something quite amazing called Risk Awareness Week, which is an online conference that offers some wonderful speakers and content on risk as a discipline, why it's broken, and how to fix it. And even if, and especially if, you aren't in the risk management industry, you will get tons of value from my conversation with Alex and from what he's doing at Risk Awareness Week. There's lots of stuff that can change your life for the better. And Alex is fun. He is, as I mentioned, quite controversial and we cover a lot of great topics, including why risk management is basically probability theory, decision science, and neuroscience, why a lot of corporate risk management is complete bullshit, how to debias yourself, some great tips from Alex on decision making, and a fun story about how Alex and some colleagues beat the lottery using some risk management techniques. So let's get into it. Here is Alex Sidorenko. Enjoy. Alex, welcome back to the All Things Risk podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on again. We had a wonderful conversation over a year ago now, so it's great to speak to you again. Thanks, Ben. It's it's a pleasure to be back. I love your stuff. I love how provocative you are, and I love talking about risk, and I think we're going to do all of that. But since we last spoke, I think a number of people have discovered all things risk and may not have listened to our original episode. So it would be wonderful if you could give a bit of a background to yourself, to your work, who you are, all of that great stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, welcome everyone to this wonderful podcast. I mean, I'm, I'm loving this, what, what you do, Ben. And um, I um, I started my my life in risk, uh, which I guess for kind of for, you, for your listeners, I'm, I'm the non-typical guest because I actually do mm-hmm. risk and just risk and uh, I do it professionally. I have I, I have a degree in risk management which was weird, you know, the first ever graduate intake in Australia to have a diploma that says risk management and that was many years ago and uh, luckily I have a second degree in statistics. I mean, who knew risk management was all about math 
Um, but then I traveled all over the world quite a bit. I moved away from Australia to Russia, worked there for a few years as a head of risk for a few large government corporations. And uh, because I'm a good risk manager, when the economy uh, turned into a pumpkin, when the Russian economy turned into a pumpkin, I actually moved to Spain and now I live in Spain and, and still do a lot of uh, training education and just you know sharing experiences about risk for, from Spain. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. What what drew you into risk management in the first place? Um, I think it was uh, it was my dad really, and uh, just like I mean, I wish I wish that story was a little bit more um, adventurous than it really is. But in reality, just like any other eighteen year old kid at the time, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, nor did I care. <laughs> and uh, uh, when I finished school, uh, I pretty much randomly selected a few possible options, and risk management was my number four. So I ended up doing risk management. That's what I got accepted to. Okay. And my dad was doing his PhD in chemical engineering at the time in that university. So it kind of you know, it was nice going to the same university as your dad. <laughs> Yeah, I actually my dad was teaching at the same undergraduate university that I that I went to as well. So yeah, it, it's, uh, it's it, it makes for an interesting experience. Um, cool. Well, could we talk a little bit about uh, your, your approach, your philosophy and take on risk management is very interesting. And it's a bit it's quite contrarian. And I, I'm wondering if you could perhaps share your own, your approach, your philosophy to, to risk management and maybe a little bit how it differs from what you might see. If everyone, anyone Googles risk management, you, you'll see loads of stuff. But uh, what, what you get from, from Risk Academy and your work is, is a little bit different. So I, I'm curious about the, where you arrived and, and what your approach is to, to risk management. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, you're absolutely right. It's uh, almost uh, the opposite of what you would traditionally find in like your first hundred top searches in Google when you mm -hmm. Google risk management. Um, so to all of your listeners, you know, whatever you do, don't Google Risk Academy, because if you do, you know, your life will change forever and <laughs> I'm not responsible for the consequences. Uh, but the reality is, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking about what the philosophy is and, and the, the real philosophy, I think that you know, the Risk Academy blog, which is arguably the most controversial blog on, um, on risk management, and I have, is that instead of recreating the wheel and chasing new best practices that just you know, come out, out of all the consulting houses and all, all the different institutes almost nonstop, Instead of kind of chasing this and reinventing the, the, the bicycle or the wheel, uh, my, my philosophy essentially is, is that we have to learn from the scientific disciplines that existed for decades or maybe hundreds of years mm. and have so far have not been disproved. And that's a very important point because you know, for most of the things that we have in risk management, there has been tests done that show that some things work better than others. And uh, uh, how I've discovered that, I mean, that was more, almost like a necessity because I was, you know, I was a very senior risk manager in large consulting houses and big four, uh, both in Australia and Russia. In fact, I was um, writing a big chunk of the global risk methodology for PwC at the time, and I thought I was amazing, you know, just <laughs> like any consultant does. But then I joined... Um, one of the biggest uh, venture funds and basically became for the first time ever I didn't become uh, I wasn't a consultant I became a head of risk a and within a few years I was fired um, mm. I, I mean I was fired for different reasons like they, they basically wanted to put in my position somebody else's friend uh, but I, I couldn't I tried but I couldn't put a, a solid business case together to keep me Hmm. And, and that was kind of the first, um, you know, awakening. Like, you know, something's not right because I was doing everything by the book. I was doing exactly what I was selling as PwC. I was selling as Deloitte. I, I was doing exactly what you know was considered best practice at the time. Hmm. And I'm going, okay, well, hmm, this is weird. I, um, uh, you know, they told me that they will, uh, you know, they will get rid of the risk function. And I, I had plenty of time to put a business case together. In fact, I, I had you know, numerous meetings with the executives. I was really, really trying hard, but 
all I had as my foundation was whatever was considered best practice in risk. So that didn't work. Um, I then uh, joined uh, uh, as a head of risk of one of the biggest uh, private equity funds. Again, government-based, you know, multi-billion corporation, mm. multi-billion dollar corporation. And then something, you know, even more amazing happened. I obviously didn't learn my lesson. I did exactly the same. I did all these best practices in three mm. months. I had everything you can think of. Risk committee, risk appetite, risk frameworks, mm -hmm. policies, uh, profiles, you know, everything, risk reports, you know, whatever you can think of, risk training, everything. And then the CEO goes, this doesn't work for me. It, I, I'm making you know, these multi-million dollar decisions every week and your, you know, your quarterly risk reports are meaningless and uh, the way you represent the information in the heat map is not telling me anything hmm. I don't know or anything I can use to actually change my investment decision making. And he goes, you, you have six months, you know, figure something out, otherwise what's the point? And then I kind of, I think that was the turning point where I think I, I went, okay, it didn't work the previous time, it still doesn't work, maybe the whole thing is just complete shambles. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe there's nothing there. And I started researching and reading a lot and luckily by that stage I already had a, you know, quite a keen interest in different works by the Simtelab, Daniel Kahneman, I mean I read most of the right. kind of, you know, traditional you know, recommended books uh, on risk management and you know, by the way if anybody wants to know what, what are my recommended books on risk management since that kind of transition just google 12 best risk management books hmm. and you will find my article in the blog which has the links to what I consider to this day the best books. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I also came, by that stage I read a book by Douglas Hubbard who is a friend of mine now um, which is called Why Risk Management is Broken and How to Fix It and I also read a book by Norman Marks who is also a friend now um, which is called World Class Risk Management and they all talked about something completely different to the world that I grew up in. And I just thought, this was so weird. And since then, um, my philo philosophy essentially for the Risk Academy became that risk management is not what is written in marketing brochures. Risk management is what is written in scientific books that has been tested, verified, and validated. And unless it has been validated, it probably is not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, once you kind of start digging in that direction, it, it becomes pretty scary because you discover that probability theory is 500 years old. You discover that decision science is like is an actual science that is more that is close to 100 years old now. You discover that uh, neuroeconomics and neuroscience is again is a whole separate field of study with their own implications. And all of those fields, I mean, decision science plus neuroscience plus probability theory, you put those three things together and you get risk management mm -hmm. because they all deal with making decisions under uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And they have the tools that, you know, best risk managers can't even dream of. They have amazing techniques. They have amazing tools. And, and you know, as you kind of go deeper and deeper, you discover that, yeah, for example, special you know, secret service has been doing this for for decades. Right, right. And, you know, CIA textbooks are still to this day some of the best textbooks you can find on decision making and and the, and the tools they have, they, they they go through very rigorous testing. So you know if it's good enough for CIA and and FBI and other uh, other you know organizations that have to make very tough calls under highest levels of uncertainty, then it's probably you know, good for us in the corporate mm -hmm. world. Right. Military planners, all of all of these types of things that, that exist and they don't they're not called risk management. I, I, gambling, right? The way casinos work and uh, how poker works as a as a game, for example, all of these things are risk management as well. But um, yeah. as you say, they don't they're not really called that. Well, I once did a search on it was one of the big four websites and I was looking for stuff on cognitive biases, and I was expecting to see thought leadership articles, what you know, what have you, and nothing came up. At least nothing in the you know risk management and audit kind of kind of space. Yeah, and, exactly. How weird is that? It is really weird. Where it did come up though was in marketing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Be because marketers 
and Secret Service have been using it for decades mm -hmm. to influence human decision making. Mm -hmm. And yet risk managers until recently have been completely ignorant to that field of study, which is amazing. It is totally amazing. It's funny. Have you thought about how how we got to this place? Because it there was a wonderful article I shared very uh, recently about Six Sigma, right? The the, uh, the the famous Six Sigma philosophy and and its decline and how it became such a religion in GE that it they became blinded to just about everything else. Mm -hmm. Not to say that there aren't good things about Six Sigma, but it 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 became a management fashion, n not necessarily, you know, not necessarily borne out by by hard science. And I'm I'm just wondering in that whole risk space, where what are your thoughts on how we got to this sort of place where risk management is a bit of a a bit of an industry and there's a we, you know, the, the the practice ignores these kinds of things like probability theory and decision science and psychology and things like this. It ignores the most fundamental yeah. sciences um, mm -hmm. that supposedly should be the foundation of, of risk. You know, I actually have given quite a lot of thought to this, and I have a hypothesis. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what was the case. In fact, I know that Douglas Hubbard is writing his second version of the risk management book uh, as we speak, hmm. and he actually went on a quest to find patient zero, you know, find that horrible human being who created this whole, you know, modern version of risk management. Um, and he got pretty close. I mean, I, I saw some of the conversation between him and one of the most respected risk managers in Australia, and I think they've kind of they they got pretty close to who that might have been. Um, you can you can guess that he was a consultant. <laughs> But the, my, my, my hypothesis is that you know, risk management, the, the idea to quantify uncertainty, the idea to analyze, understand uncertainty, and the idea to make decisions under uncertainty, that really started in, in the kind of mid-16th century. So risk management existed for hundreds of years, but it was just like all the other you know, complex disciplines, because, you know, we're talking about trying to guess future, appreciate the the way future may affect our objectives, mm. and make decisions better, considering what may happen in the future. So, I mean, if if we could do that, if it was physically possible, then um, you know, we would all be fortune tellers and amazingly mm -hmm. rich, and um, you know, we would be very successful. Mm -hmm. um, so, so clearly, it's very difficult task for humans to think about the future. We're not really designed, I think our, our evolution hasn't designed us in that, in that particular way. Um, so it, for, ye for hundreds of years, people tried to kind of grasp that uncertainty and make sense of it. And it is a very, very complex subject that requires you know, special skills, that requires mathematical skills. And, and then by 19, I think it was late 1970s, I think this is what happened, and I think this is what usually happens. When something is good but highly complex, somebody just hijacks it and dumbs it down for marketing purposes. Mm. So, I, my, my, again, I have no idea what really happened, but my hypo hypothesis is somebody hijacked risk management, called it risk management, first of all, because it was never called risk management before then. You know, you know, probability theory existed for hundreds of years, and wasn't really called risk management per se. Um, he called it, you know, a sexy name. Made the name sexy, uh, then made it even sexier by creating it with this, you know, bullshit concept called <laughs> ERM. I mean, that was just, you know, what 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 a, what a load of nonsense that is. Um, but they 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 basically hijacked it and started marketing it for the general public. Hmm. Started marketing it to the independent directors, to the regulators. To the auditors, to uh, you know your executive, and they just you know, they they didn't they didn't like it wasn't an overnight success, but still they made I mean you know, the the community that continues to propel that myth that risk management is 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 new and risk management mm. is all corporate governance and transparency and the ERM 
um, that, I mean, um, they made a fortune, obviously, but they clearly did a huge disservice to the actual risk professionals or to the decision makers in the corporations. And, and now, I mean, you know, just Google GRC or ERM or some other um, acronym that is uh, is sexy lately, and that there are hundreds of software options. Yeah, there are. You know, there is a national institute that propels that myth in every single country. There are risk management institutes, not not just national risk management institutes. There are now global risk management institutes that combine all the national institutes into like an, an, an umbrella corporation. And um, so there is now a whole population of organization that basically feed on this myth that you know risk management exists and that supposedly risk management is all about you know risk appetites and risk frameworks and um, you know, risk reporting and risk profiles and you know whatever 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 nonsense they come up with next there's something i was thinking about when you were describing the 1970s because the 1970s were a very tumultuous time in the global economy the, the Nixon got rid of the gold standard. There was the 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 OPEC oil crisis. There's a lot of things that 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 came out of the blue to many people um, that perhaps shouldn't have, but but they certainly did. Uh, and and then you know, it becomes very attractive to say here's a way in which we can manage away uncertainty. And you know t- it, there's something very comforting in that. So I, I can see from a potentially a marketing standpoint. How that that would have that would have worked, and uh, and and so I think your hypothesis is is probably that there's something quite valid to it. I think it's a very uh, it, it sounds like a very perfectly valid hypothesis. Of course, since then all kinds <laughs> yeah. of uncertainties have happened, and we haven't been able to manage them away. So it also suggests that that a lot of this stuff that that's been overly hyped isn't working as it should either. It, maybe it was never even meant to, to work. I mean, maybe that, not. That's the yeah. thing. Mm. Um, when we when we kind of when we lost that, you know, rigor and uh, verification in the risk community. I mean, has anybody even validated that you know that mm. having a risk appetite statement works better mm. than no, than just having your risk, you know, tolerance and limits uh, inside other policies that you know board level approves anyway? It, no, nobody verifies that. We just kind of we go from conference to conference. Just listening to consultants. Uh, yeah. I mean, th- this is my l- th- this is my <laughs> latest uh, pet peeve. I mean, why on earth would I go to a risk management conference to hear what a broker has to say? Right. I mean, seriously, I mean, right. this is just insane. <laughs> right. Well, the uh, the you know those stock footage stock photos that you see in marketing brochures they usually they're, there's their typical um theme so one of them is a bunch of people looking at a map for example or mm-hmm. looking at a chart and just kind mm-hmm. of lo- like they're in a meeting or um no one ever looks like that in a meeting um but the the the, the text equivalent uh, equivalent of that in my view are all of those articles that start by saying in our Highly uncertain, hyper-connected world, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they, they even come up with the, I mean, I, I pretty much, whenever I see VUCA world, mm-hmm. what's that? Volatile Vol- Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, yeah. and ambiguity, yep. I, I, I'm just going, oh my God, you're so fortunate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's, it's not to say that some of the things... That, you know, that, that lie behind some of those concepts aren't don't have some validity, but, but, but yeah. you know what's the scariest thing? Mm-hmm. The, and I mean, this is the, this this is the only thing that makes me really really sad. I um, because the influence of uh, those ideas and the marketing appeal is now so strong that I actually know a dozen. Really, really, really good risk managers, like you know, quantitative, mm. very sophisticated, like you know, some of the most amazing people I've met. I mean, all of them are, by the way, speakers at the um, at, at the Risk mm. Awareness Week. They they not concede, but they also they, they they almost rephrase and rename some of the things that they do to appeal to a broader public. Right. I mean, you could have called it like decision making, or you could have called it uncertainty, but they choose to call it ERM because they know that there's just a market for that kind of approach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that sounds that does sound sad. So in in your so so your philosophy on risk management really is get back to the basics of what works in science, probability theory, decision science, neuroscience. Uh, that all that all makes great sense. Let's talk a little bit about Risk Awareness Week and what what that is, what your vision for it is, and what's what, what, what's going to what's going to happen during Risk Awareness Week. And when is it, by the way? Um, so from 14th to 18th of October. So that's five days, and it's almost nonstop days. I think like 55 or more workshops uh, that are going to run back to back. And uh, different, I mean, different speakers from all over the world will present their take on proper decision making, proper decision science, proper probability mm-hmm. theory, and they'll actually talk about and show. I mean, most of them are doing like live presentations showing models and calculations. They will show how you were meant to use risk management as a decision making tool from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. How instead of, I mean. None of them create a risk register or a a risk profile or or a risk report. They actually show you how to make meaningful business decisions using the information about uncertainty uh, in the kind of in the process, how to frame decisions, how to choose alternatives, how to model effects of uncertainty on objectives and and so on. And and the whole the whole risk awareness week, I mean, I think it really started as a necessity I was uh, receiving uh, probably the 101st brochure about a risk management conference, Mm -hmm. and out of interest, I always look at the list of speakers, and it's always just sponsors talking about some... uh, It it kind of goes into two different uh, buckets. Uh, First bucket, it's uh, the people that are clueless about risk management. They talk about practices that we know never worked and have been disproved for decades. And they just still continue talking about that because they, they, they don't have a clue. And then the second portion of the speakers is they're talking about some aspirational ideas that maybe will happen one day, sometime in the future, artificial intelligence. Mm. And, and I find both kind of speakers hilarious uh, because first one is, you know, they're talking about something that has been disproved. And the second group of speakers, I just find absolutely hilarious. I mean, talking about artificial intelligence to a group of people they don't even know how Perth distribution is better than triangular distribution or why um, you know normal distribution shouldn't be used for um, many variables in the real life. Um, you know, people that don't have any appreciation for even the basic level of mathematics and statistics, you know, talking to them about artificial intelligence, I mean, it's, mm. I think I personally find it insulting. <laughs> Right, right. So, uh, we so so this is an online conference, right? For is and, it and that's the that's mm-hmm. the thing. Mm-hmm. I I um I, I mean, first, I'm extremely grateful for so many amazing speakers who I personally know, and I know they do proper risk analysis when making decisions uh, uh, in the actual live and work. And uh, the the only kind of the only real way. To get all of them together in one place for a week was to create the whole thing online. Sure. And luckily, you know, in 2019, we have the technology that allows us to collect all those people together, run um, events, huge events uh, online. I mean, as we speak, I think there's close to a thousand people that signed up uh, to to the conference. And by the time the conference actually starts in mid October. I expect close to three, three thousand, three and a half thousand people. Fantastic! Um, so, you know, don't need a room. Can get amazing speakers in the same place at the same time, going one after another without all the logistical hassles. And uh, people, because you know, because everybody lives in different uh, uh, time zones, it, it has you know a much broader reach than a normal conference. Because people can watch either live if it's in their time zone, or they can watch the replay if they, you know, if they sleep while the conference is is going. And you know, just like everything Risk Academy does, I tried to I seriously I tried so hard to make it as affordable as possible. Um, there are free tickets available for a limited number of sessions, but if you want to watch uh, more more sessions that the free ticket allows you, it goes like gradually. It goes like twenty bucks. 45 bucks, 75 bucks, and 100. And for 100, you can watch like all 50 
something workshops, uh, which again, unheard of. Um, so I, I like I like disrupting existing um, industries. For example, <laughs> I, I I do not understand why a conference should cost two thousand know, pounds uh, for attendance, especially yeah. when you have sponsors. <laughs> doing most of the presentation it's an amazing it's an amazing business model because you get you you charge people to attend the conference and then you charge people to speak and sponsor exactly Um, you charge people at both ends so i I, yeah i agree with you I, i don't really understand why you might go there to get you know some specific insights when there's especially for risk management you know well you know Clearly, there's a conflict of interest already with regard to uh, provide, you know, the, uh, providing good content versus um, y- y- trying to get sponsors. So, uh, you, so huge, why, huge. why would someone why would someone want to get the leading, you know, some leading thinking when it's 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 basically stuff that you could probably read from a brochure? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, I'm speaking at a lot of conferences, and most of them they want they they all pretend. Like they want um, you know, amazing futuristic thinking, but most of them are not prepared to pay. So mm-hmm. you know, for for your traveling costs, I mean, why would I fly to US to mm-hmm. share my experience with, with people there uh, unless I have something to sell? So it basically just ends up like you know, consultants trying to sell something, and uh, consulting companies trying to sell, and insurance and brokers trying to sell to potential client base. Um, so it's it's essentially a marketing meeting with free food, mm-hmm. which is a you know, nice way to look at it, but it doesn't really cost that much. Uh, so I thought, uh, stuff that, we're doing something completely different. Mm-hmm. Could we talk about some of the, the sessions that, that uh, you've, you've got planned, so <laughs> some that might be a little bit um, uh, different or unusual that you're looking yeah, forward absolutely. to? Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I've, uh, I've I've had a lot of conversations in the kind of in the lead up to the conference, discussing what what are some of the key topics. And I mean, it's amazing, it, which it, it's kind of embarrassing, but I will be watching every single one mm-hmm. because it's it's, it's mind blowing. Um, and uh, you know, those people don't get together; that they never get together. All the, the group of people that. Uh, you know, agreed to be speakers that they never get together. So this is the you know, once in a lifetime opportunity. But I, um, I, I build the logic in the following way: day one, so it's five days, and it's like it's literally nonstop from early morning to evening. Uh, uh, day one, it's about breaking everything we know about risk management. So okay. I, I, I literally have people that destroy our traditional view of risk management. Could you give and, me some and, examples of of those um, sessions? <laughs> so the first one, for example, the first one, first Monday morning uh, is done by Grant Purdy. Mm. Grant Purdy is uh, one of the most famous Australian risk managers, and he's the, he's the person who is behind first the Australian standard, then the ISO 31000. He was one of the kind of the... the uh, ideologists, the creators of, of, of the standard. And he's now retired. That means he's being honest about everything. And he's challenging the, uh, well, I mean, the, I think the session is called, um, I, I can't remember what the session is called, but it's, it's something, it, it, something is like misdemeanor of risk management or something right. very similar. It, and he's very honestly sharing how the whole version or the whole vision of risk management that was sold to us as best practice is just absolute nonsense. It just got out of control so quickly. It became just a marketing uh, promotion piece than anything useful. And he's basically saying that he's giving a lot of examples and he's saying um, that it's time to go back to basics Mm. and start um, making and using risk, start using risk management to make better decisions. He's essentially saying it's all about decision making. Unless your risk analysis leads to a different decision, then there's no point. Mm-hmm. They, that, that corporate governance, the whole thing that we have under the umbrella of ERM, it's just it's absolute nonsense. Right. So that's a wonderful session. Right. I loved your. Here, by the way, I loved your interview with Grant. I, I listened to it a few months ago, and yeah, you're right. He's this kind of 
um, grandfather of 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 stuff. He's almost it, it almost sounds to me like he's a bit not shocked, but a bit you know quite disheartened by the way some of the things that he created has have transformed evolved yeah how, how they have been uh, misused and mm-hmm. abused by consultants and auditors all over the world and, and i mean he's i mean i i asked him whether i can call it confessions but he, he said no you should not read <laughs> confessions it, it's it's more uh, i think the realization and coming back to basics Right. Saying like we we've had enough of this risk conversation. It clearly doesn't work. I, I I mean I saw some of the bullet points. He's one of his bullet points. It says kill risk management. Stop <laughs> kicking the dead horse. Forget about risk management. Forget it ever existed. It's all about decision making because if you open a good book on decision making, it covers risk management mm-hmm. anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. Step three in any decision making methodology is understand how uncertainty affects, you know, challenge assumptions, model uncertainty, alternatives, and so on. Uh, so risk management is already part of decision making. When you say, I want to make a quality decision, that implies that you would consider and do proper risk analysis. Mm-hmm. You don't need a separate word called risk management, or risk analysis. So, I mean, th- that is mind-blowing. Then right after him is Sam Savage. Sam mm-hmm. Savage is the author of the book called Flow of Averages. Mm-hmm. And he talks about just you know, fascinating things. Why? I mean, he shows uh, in his presentation how every single business on the planet fails to consider uncertainty when planning, when budgeting, when making investment decisions. Every single business on the planet makes that mistake of ignoring mm-hmm. uncertainty. And, and there's, there's, you know, he calls it the flow of averages. Mathema- the mathematical name is J- Jensen's inequality, mm. which was a theorem uh, proved by a Danish uh, mathematician in 1906, um, which basically shows that unless, if you make uh, forecasts and plans based on averages or most likely, which is what every single business on the planet does, you fail on average. Right. That means you fail most of the, you know, you, you fail often, very often, uh, because you ignore you know, the very nature of life, which is uh, <laughs> uncertainty. So, I mean, you know, fascinating things. Or, for example, you know, Warren Black, another um, guy from Australia, who uh, studied chaos theory, and he's saying that the life is changing so rapidly now that n- not only... You know, qualitative risk risk management you know, that is considered best practice is rubbish, but you also need to move into much more complex systems because even even you know even some of the mathematical tools that we use do not allow us to capture the full complexity of the future, hmm. and we need to not just use the tools from the probability theory, decision science, and neuroscience, but we also need to start looking into complexity theory and chaos theory as an inspiration for some of the you know, techniques uh, that we use. Again, mm-hmm. that's a field of science. That's, mm-hmm. not, that's not a brochure that you know, productivity issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a great first day, a great start. That, that, that's, I mean, I, I'm not exaggerating. Day one, if you've been, you know, to whoever is listening to us, if you've been in risk, day one will blow your mind. Mm-hmm. I have grouped some of the people that challenge everything you heard about risk management that's just day one i mean that in itself is a worthwhile investment absolutely I mean, that, that, that will change your life forever if you work in risk mm. um second day is all about culture neuroscience and uh um neuroeconomics so that's where we're talking a lot about different cognitive biases how mm-hmm. the human brain works why despite what your auditors and best practice guides tell you the decision makers will never start making decisions with risk in mind by themselves. Why people ignore risk because it's built in our, into our evolution. Why our, at the chemical level, our brain is designed in the way to ignore uncertainty. Yeah, all those very, very profound implications. Mm. For That's so fascinating. Yeah, that that's so fascinating, and and uh, maybe we just park there for for a moment um, because I'm sure you you'll cover this in the in the in the conference. But one of the things when you say we're, we're evolutionarily programmed to ignore and that makes a lot of sense because you know we 
we want to get on with things, right? So things in the periphery uh, tend to be, we, we tend to ignore them. And that, that happens all the time in, you know, you think about uh, when you're driving and getting, you're driving through a rough stretch of road or whatever, then all of a sudden everything is muted in terms of whatever you're talking about, whatever's on the radio, you know, it just, you switch off, right? And all of these things that we, we tend to ignore that, that are just fundamental to our biology. Exactly. And I mean, again, like none of that is surprising. No. Because for the last 50 years, groups of scientists have been researching that and making very profound conclusions. Mm. I mean, two Nobel Prizes in economics. I mean, what, what, what else do we want? I mean, how many Nobel Prizes in economics, you know, or any other field for heat maps? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. None. What, what about just, just, just thought, what about debiasing? How, how, how uh, are there some is there some thinking around how we can overcome cognitive biases i i don't think we can ever eliminate them but what what is apparently that? apparently you can you just have to electrocute part of your brain <laughs> right. there's a small section of okay. your brain that if you apply electricity to that yeah. cognitive biases tend to disappear right. but okay. you you also become uh, a horrible person yeah. and uh, possibly die but you know <laughs> right. maybe it's worth it right. um uh, well the whole risk awareness weekend, again, I invite everyone to participate. You know, you, you can watch a selected series of workshops for free, and it's really cheap otherwise. Mm -hmm. I invite everybody to, because you know, the whole idea is that throughout the week, you will get answers how to plan better with risk, come down certainty, how to make decisions in life, how to make investment decisions, how to make you know, moving your house decisions, mm. under uncertainty better. Yeah, the, the, there's a lot of valuable material there uh, but just to kind of to give you uh, a a little taste of how i personally uh, make decisions under uncertainty it, it's uh, it's really a sequence of simple uh, simple steps the first the first point to remember that comes to us from um, neuroscience and that basically tells us that inside our brain there are two voices one is kind of quick and simple and irrational the other one is slow but rational and the thing is, the one that is, you know, and Daniel Kahneman, who's mm. kind of the godfather, the, the grandfather of uh, neuroscience, he calls it system one and system two thinking. Uh, well, the, the problem with that is uh, that system one, the quick and irrational one, is much louder. Mm. And it's very, very convincing. So as a general rule of thumb, whenever you're trying to make a tough decision, whatever comes first to mind is pretty much guaranteed to be not the optimal option. Mm. That's the general rule of thumb. Whatever comes to mind almost immediately, you can almost guarantee that that system one, that by definition means it's not optimal. There's a better, there's a better option. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you know, we risk managers, that's what we do. We essentially, we know that the first decision is not going to be optimal. So we have to pause and use different techniques to force our brain, almost trick our brain, to switch to system two, which is our you know, rational considerate and kind of you know, our mm. slow thinking. So we essentially, we use different techniques to trick us into switching a more, into a more sensible state, and then we start seeing things that were not obvious to us. And for that, I have three tools which um, are just absolutely amazing. The first one is actually borrowed from uh, CIA. It's called Key Assumptions Check. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a technique that I hope every single human being applies in any situation that is of consequence. So if it's important enough, use that technique. The, the, the idea is very simple. Key Assumptions Check basically means decompose what are some of the assumptions or inputs or requirements for your decision to be a success? Ah, find out what those assumptions are and then ask, <coughs> sorry, ask yourself a question. Is this assumption valid? Is it still valid? Where is it coming from? Do I trust the source? Is it reliable? Mm. Am I not um, just blindly following the blind? Is this the actual, is this information actually, you know, verifiable and you know, to our surprise most of the time when we do that we realize that our decisions are actually made on fairy tales 
that nobody ever checked. I mean, the funniest thing I heard was at the, at the recent conference in US was military, when they started challenging some of the assumptions that were built into their models, into their decision frameworks, they found assumptions from First World War. Hmm. Not Second World War, First World War. Right. Somebody put it there and everybody just blindly followed because nobody bothered to check that it still holds true. Obviously, mm -hmm. it didn't because it, you know, it's 100 years old. And uh, um, that, that was... That, that's the, that's the first technique. The second technique is called scoring, mm. and, and that's basically whenever we have a, a number of choices, we have to. Uh, a, and I mean, a piece of paper is the best risk management right. instrument we have. It, it's unbelievable. I mean, my wife hates me for doing that. I make her draw everything on paper, and I do that as well for personal decisions. I mean, we were cho we were choosing recently. We were choosing a place for our six year, uh, for our daughter's sixth uh, birthday, mm -hmm. and we had so many different options. And it was impossible to make a decision in our mind until we put it on the paper, list all the options, and then determine determine a criteria, and just go plus minus plus minus plus minus, and what are the different risks and what are the different you know, positive things for each of the alternatives. And when you map out the alternatives in such a very simplistic way, I mean, it takes like you know, five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, when you do that, suddenly the decision becomes much, much clearer. Uh, and this is, I mean, these two techniques, key assumptions check and uh, scoring, this is, these are all very like kindergarten techniques. Yeah. And then the final one, which we use for serious decisions, is of course using scenarios and simulations. If we if we need to quantify something, then we usually build like a very simple model, and we try to quantify uh, what the future may look like. And, and here's the here's the kind of the secret sauce: the future. And um, th this is my favorite quote: the future is plural. That means mm. there are always multiple futures. There's no one you know perfect uh, world scenario that will happen. There's, there are always a multitude of possible scenarios. And that's why when we're trying to quantify future, we use scenario, uh, scenarios and we use ranges. That, that's why no good risk manager on the planet would ever talk about deterministic values. They would never say something is an X or, you know, 5 million or 7 mm -hmm. million or 3. Uh, we always talk about ranges. And we always talk about ranges and confidence intervals. That, that, that means... I'm saying you know, sending kids to school will cost me between five and seven thousand euros ninety percent of the time. Mm -hmm. That means five percent of the time it may cost me less, and five percent of the time it may cost me significantly more. Mm -hmm. But that's 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 again you know, this is very uncommon for humans to instead of going for a single deterministic future, talk about possible ranges and uh, apply you know confidence interval saying. I'm only 30% confident that this is the future that will be. And there's a 70% chance that it will be completely different to what I expect. Um, this is uh, difficult for many people, for many people to grasp. It is, it is. And, it, but those are very, those are very valid techniques. And I, I, I think if, if you apply them you on a regular basis then for the most part you you well you will make quality decisions and even when you don't i i talk about the zone of regret versus the zone of disappointment so zone of disappointment is you you do get the you know the five percent that yep. you didn't anticipate but you understood that that was that was possible and zone of regret is you don't have any idea <laughs> you, you know something exactly Gets you and right then, out of can, the blue. Can I can I, can I uh, just finish up with an amazing story? We, yes. we just, I, I just I just think it's you know it's it's mind blowing. So um, you know I've uh, you know part of the controversial kind of persona of Risk Academy Online is that I constantly give a lot of grief to the people that try to promote uh, you know outdated, clearly not working, and purely marketing approach to risk management. Mm. Uh, but then when I do that a lot. You know, people, you know, they, they kind of, the silly defenses, uh, you know, prove that whatever your version of the world is, is better. So from time to time, I have to prove to myself and to everyone else um, that, you know, proper risk management pays off. Uh, so this is what I did. Uh, I think it was June. I think it was in June. This is what I did in June. 
I asked around, because I, I know most of the risk managers in Russian-speaking countries, I asked, uh, I asked around and we got a group of 13 risk managers, including some of the best risk managers in the country. So it's a very, you know, it's a very senior, uh, senior group. Mm -hmm. And I said, why don't we put our money where our mouth is and prove that proper risk management pays off? And they said, okay, let's, 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 let's do it. How do we do it? I said, let's win a lottery. Let's see if we can use mathematics and proper risk analysis and make money in the lottery, which, you know, is mathematically losing business. Mm. It's basically... It's designed. It's mathematically designed to lose money. I said, "Well, can we make money using our skills? I mean, we are probably the best risk managers in the country. And you know, Russia is a big country." I said, "Shall we?" And we did. Uh, for for ten days, we started building. Uh, we started building different models, and and I mean, we applied every single technique we could think of in terms of risk management. So, for example, first, we had blue team and red team mm -hmm. uh, in the best tradition of, of uh, special so, you know, secret service. We broke up the team, uh, our 13 people, into two groups. One was modeling using one technique. The other one was uh, modeling using a different technique. Then we matched the two approaches, and they, they, they were equal. They were very similar. That means our initial hypothesis was good. Then we um, uh, then we started using trying different strategies. We started modeling different scenarios. I mean, we modeled tens of thousands of possible scenarios and strategies, and uh, we've tried all the strategies uh, suggested by the lottery website itself, by the lottery company, mm -hmm. and we found that every single strategy that they market and promote to the general public, they were actually high risk. Okay. We found right. everything that they promote to the unsuspecting public is actually high risk. And we ended up selecting a strategy that was 90% of the time was giving us a return between 50% to 100% profit. Wow. That's, and that's pure profit after taxes. <laughs> wow. And, and because we're a group of risk managers, we had an independent uh, treasurer who was collecting the money, we, uh, we included taxes and all the commissions and all our calculations. Uh, we all signed a legal agreement that, uh, you know, risk management is not a precise uh, discipline. We're talking about the future. There's a chance. There is a probability of losing portion of your money and you will not complain if that happens. We had legal agreement signed. Everybody was uh, doing that. Um, and um, we selected a strategy that had an 8% chance of losing up to 60% of our invested capital. Hmm. So if you put in 1,000, there is a 8% chance that you would lose up to 600 right. of, of that money. But then it had a 90% chance upside. Hmm. Uh, but the upside, and this is very important, I mean, this is why it was a risk management uh, game, not a speculative game. 90% of the time, our profit would be between 50 and 100%. That means we could double our money, but it's highly unlikely that we would more than double our money. Right. So it's, it's, you know, even though it's a lottery, we wouldn't uh, become you know, billionaires mm -hmm. or millionaires. We would just double our money, which is actually pretty amazing. I mean, you know, 10 days to double your money, that's not a bad deal. No. You know? that, it doesn't happen often in real life. Mm -hmm. With only with only eight percent downside, I mean that's that's a pretty pretty good deal, and it was actually it was actually so funny. Uh, one of my friends, who is like a very senior and, and you know, an amazing risk manager, uh, we were collecting all the money, so we were all submitting to the independent treasurer our amounts of money that we wanted to invest, uh, and uh, he's he's keeping quiet for the whole day, and I'm writing to him going we had we and the whole thing we we were all in different places. The whole thing happened in WhatsApp. We were literally just communicating in WhatsApp and just in Google Disk, we were sharing the models. Uh, the whole thing happened distantly with, within just 10 days. Hmm. And uh, so he's quiet and I'm sending a message going like, what's going on? How much money are you submitting? And, and he's, he's keeping quiet for the whole day. And then at the end of the day, he goes, um, I want to submit, um, I want to chip in, I, I can't remember the exact amount, but something like 50 grand. 
50, you know, 50,000 euros. Hmm. And we're like, you, you can't. The whole strategy needs uh, needs you to chip in like uh, you know five or ten. I can't remember the actual amount. Right. Uh, and he goes, I want I want to chip in fifty because you can't. You you can only do five. But no, no. I I've done the calculations. It's bloody amazing. It's ninety to it's ninety to ten. It, it's mind blowing. I mean, this is like it doesn't happen so uh, very often. So I I want to take this opportunity right. to double my money to change my to life. Yeah. <laughs> I want to chip in 50 and, and obviously he couldn't at the end he, mm-hmm. he could only chip in you know, five or something and, and uh, this is just this was this was so funny but the, you know, the, the 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 final kind of part of the story is that the most the biggest risk was not doing the calculations and the mathematics but the actual physical ability to, you know to to make our strategy happen mm-hmm. we had to buy I think like five or six thousand tickets which is actually yeah, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's ridiculous. It's almost it's a hard impossible. thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it's actually almost impossible to buy that many tickets physically mm. because you have to fill in the numbers. It, it literally, it's like it's it's it, it's almost like a few days' work nonstop for a group of people to doing that. So we had another guy who wrote a software which was imitating human behavior that would place all those bits online. And that was just, I mean, that was just mind-blowing stuff. Wow. We, we had a, and that, that software was built in half a day to, to make the whole thing happen. I, I mean, the, the whole story, I mean, I'm sure they'll, you know, I'm sure we'll continue winning more money and they'll make a movie out of it, uh, out of it someday. Uh, <laughs> this is just, I mean, this is just mind-blowing. Right. Is this, is this, um, a, a, is this a, a study at all that, that you can share the link to or... Is, that that you, you're not there yet yeah no absolutely on risk academy there's an article uh, i actually made a series of articles it's called uh, the triumph on quantity of quantitative risk analysis okay but if you just if you just search for lottery risk academy you'll you'll find uh, this article immediately i was writing an article i wrote the first part of the article when i just suggested the idea i wrote the second part of the article when we were halfway through the modeling and I wrote the final part of the article, third part, after we won. Our final winnings were 86% profit after taxes. Wow. So we, we were actually, I mean, con- everything considered, we were quite unlucky. So we were just, you know, just, just listen to this. We were unlucky and we almost doubled our money. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> that's so that's it, amazing. It, and in the in the end of the article, I, I wrote, "Try doing that with your heat map." <laughs> as, as okay. A bit of a okay. <laughs> uh, I'm sure many of my listeners are going to check that out, so I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, <laughs> amazing. That's that's uh, that's an amazing story. Um, I'd like to wrap it up soon, but before um, before we do that, well, was there anything about the, the the week? Or I mean, I feel like we can keep keep going for for a long time but we probably do need to wrap it up but was there anything that you wanted to mention about the either risk generally or risk awareness week oh i know i was i was going to ask you this um do you get any pushback or criticism or any hate from the traditional i don't know either the big four the traditional risk community or anything like that and if so how do you how do you deal with that um i Interestingly, the I'm I'm probably still you know not big enough fish for the large corporations to notice me. I mean, to be okay. completely honest, uh, I get a lot of hate. Okay, but from individuals, uh, mainly small consultants that try to make a uh, living on selling bullshit, okay. and uh, they they, um, they they are they are obviously giving me a lot of grief. Mm. And uh, other than that, um, the institutes and the associations. I think they feel more intimidated and scared. For example, some of them, I mean, one, the, like, the biggest European one, they stopped inviting me as a speaker to the conference. Oh. Um, but, you know, it, as if I cared. <laughs> um, but other, other than that, uh, it, it's, that, that, I think that's, that, that's what annoys and uh, frustrates and makes me very upset the most, mm. is that I've been saying exactly the same thing for the last seven years. And a lot of people, and you know, since then, I mean, the 50 plus something people that will be speaking during the Risk Awareness Week are all the people that I found 
who share my passion for proper decision making and proper risk mm-hmm. analysis. They, they, I mean, every single message will be exactly the same. It's all about decision making. Stop reinventing the wheel. The wheel. Here's how you do it. Just open any old textbook on decision making. I mean, you don't have to you know, come up with new best practice. It's all there. We've been doing this for decades. I found, luckily, I found a lot of people who think exactly, exactly, uh, exactly the same. But what really frustrates me and makes me upset is that this has been going on for for years. I mean, every single, oh, oh, sorry, not every single, but many of the speakers during the Risk Awareness Week have amazing books. I mean, most of those books have been written in 2009. Hmm. That's more than 10 years ago. I mean, this is just, you know, this is just embarrassing beyond belief. And uh, what really makes me upset is that most of the institute associations and corporations that promote you know, what I call risk management one, which is basically just this window dressing stuff, mm-hmm. um, they just pretend it doesn't exist. They do not acknowledge it. Wow. They don't mention it. They they just continue pushing their own agenda, you know, trying to convince us that, you know, for example, risk management is a profession. Right. Risk management is not a profession. Risk management is just a, a skill set that every decision maker you know should have, um, and that they they're trying to convince us that doing they have certification programs, they have training mm-hmm. programs, and on that they teach that it's okay if all you can do is you know color code boxes in the heat map, then you you already are a good risk manager. Don't listen to the people that say that you actually need a degree in statistics or mathematics to understand and appreciate uncertainty about the future. They say, no, don't worry about that. You just have to you know, use beautiful colors. And as long as you talk uh, very uh, confidently about it, that will, you know, that will be fine. That's, so that's interesting. That's, that's yeah, scares, scares. yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's a bit scary. It's also, but I, I, as you were talking, I was trying. I was thinking of a parallel, and that that actual parallel was to the fitness industry and strength training. Um, and it's this that the one of the best pieces of fitness equipment that you can buy are free weights. Exactly. To get strong. I keep saying and, that to and my wife. Things, exactly. She hates me for that. Right. And 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 so you, you you buy them. You buy them once. You probably never have to replace them. Yep. But if you are in the fitness industry, that's a terrible thing to sell because you can't. You, once you sell them once, then you know that that's it. You, you know. So so the fitness industry creates all these new programs, techniques, machines, whatever, and it's a it's a you know multi billion dollar industry. But if you want to get stronger, the best thing that you can buy are a set of free weights. Yeah, exactly. I mean, or, or make them at home. For God's yeah. Sake. Yeah. So it's a, it's a similar idea that, you know, once you've got someone that, that's trained in statistics, well, it's kind of, you know, that that's, that's kind of hard to, uh, uh, the, 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 there's not much more value add that a, a consultancy can, can provide. Kind, kind of. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I love that analogy. I mean, that, that is essentially exactly it. Hmm. We're trying to say very simple things. It's all about decision making and decision making is not that difficult, you know, to a degree that you can never guess the future, but you can at least estimate possible futures. And there, I mean, the, the simulation techniques that we use, you know, Monte Carlo uh, simulation, been for example. Been around for a while, yeah. It, it, it's been around since 1946. Mm. I, mean, I mean, come on. And not only that, but computing power is so much more that we should all be able to do these things at our, at our laptops or on our phones. The, the you know as preparing for the risk awareness week i mean the discovery for me was that uh, not only most of the software to allow us to simulate in excel is free mm. but it's not just free we can now also use it on the phone right right so, so not not even the computer on your phone yeah. I, I mean this is just mind blowing yeah yeah that's that is fascinating uh, it sounds like it's going to be a great week and i you know this will go out just before that, and I urge my my listeners to check it out because I'm sure they'll learn a lot. Even if they just tune in for a couple of the sessions, it sounds like it'll be time well, well worth spending. Absolutely. Fantastic. Before we go, where can people find out more about Risk Awareness Week and sign up and all of that good stuff? Yeah. The the um, the website, I mean, well, by now, I've, I've, I've been trying 
to do my best to spread the message. So by now, if you Google Risk Awareness Week, it will be everywhere. Um, but the actual website address is 2019.riskawarenessweek.com. Perfect. And in terms of finding you on the, the internet, where, where is the best place for, for people to follow you? Uh, Risk Academy. Uh, Google in Risk Academy is, um, it will, will take you to the um, to, to the you know, to, to all the resources that I've done, or um, if you want to learn about risk management, uh, try googling free risk management book. Right. And uh, um, the book that uh, I and a friend of mine, Elena Demidenko, wrote a few years back has now become the most downloaded, the most popular free risk management book on the planet. Um, you know, which is not that hard. It sounds impressive, but it's not really, um, because there are not that many free risk management books on the right. planet. But right. It's, it's the biggest one. Right. Perfect. Alex, this is awesome. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm I'm sure the Risk Awareness Week will go very well. And please continue doing what you do. Thank you very much, Ben. All right. Bye and for thank now. Thank you, Alison. I'll see you at the Risk Awareness Week. Absolutely. All right, please check out Risk Awareness Week and Alex's work. And if you are listening to this after the 18th of October 2019, check out the recordings from Risk Awareness Week. The links to all of that are available in the show notes. Also, I'd love to hear from you via our listener survey. Please take two to three minutes to fill that out. The link is also in the show notes. It will help me make this show even better. And that is it. We will be back soon. Until then, and as always, don't forget, risk is life.